I'm Robert Spinner. I'm chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic. I'm uh, the Burton Onofrio Professor of Neurosurgery and a professor of orthopedics and anatomy at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Robert Spinner, Chair of Neurosurgery at Mayo Clinic. He joined the neurosurgical faculty at Mayo in 2001, developed a practice limited to peripheral nerve surgery. He's had a CASA-proof fellowship in peripheral nerve for more than a decade. He's trained many clinical and basic science fellows, board-certified neurosurgeon orthopedics, as well as a journal editor and an active member of surgical societies in both specialties. He's been president of the American Society of Peripheral Nerve, Sutherland Society. He's currently president of the American Association of Clinical Autonomists. He's chaired the academic appointment and Promotions Committee at Mayo since 2012. More than 600 publications and has given over 1,000 presentations in this subspecialty. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Robert Spinner, Chair of Neurosurgery at Mayo Clinic. Doc, how are we doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being with us. So let's just jump right into it. What were your goals and aspirations during your residencies, and how did those change during your fellowship? Well, I did uh, two residencies. I started in orthopedics, thinking I was interested in peripheral nerve surgery via a hand surgery route. Halfway through my orthopedic residency, I realized that I actually liked spinal disorders, including the dura, and I wanted to know more about peripheral nerves by understanding the brain. To be honest, when I was going through my orthopedic residency, I think the word survival was probably my mantra. Uh, There really wasn't a lot of uh, discussion in my mind about what I wanted to do beyond that. It was every other night call and getting through till the next call cycle. Things have evolved. Fortunately, now we have work restrictions and hour restrictions and things of that. So you actually have some time for creativity, which I think is important. When I decided to do neurosurgery, it was really quite simple. My mentor uh, was uh, David Klein. During my second residency, I did an infolded uh, fellowship with him down in New Orleans, and I got to do full-time peripheral nerve for a year, and that was really a highlight. Through him, it really became clear that my decision to do the second residency was the smart one because I wanted to know about the brain related to peripheral nerve. And I think that's an important concept. And I think it was one of the differentiators in my career. Having that relationship, especially before my chief resident year in neurosurgery, allowed me to think about my own career and what I wanted to do. And it was really easy. I wanted to be like him. So in order to be like him, I needed to be at the top of the game. Even meeting him and having that opportunity early on, which was during my residency, a second residency, gave me sort of a pillar to shoot for, an aspiration, a dream that fortunately has been uh, able to be transpired. So during that fellowship, can you kind of take us through your mentality when you were heading into the job search process for the first time and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Well, I think during the uh, job search, um, I really didn't know very much about any of the things about business or anything like that is I wanted to carve out a niche. Uh, What I do is a very small part of practice. It's a very small percent of neurosurgery. Uh, I liken it to being an orphan drug. So I've told people it's sort of an island but if it's an island, I want it to be my island. Uh, we, we summer in Barbados, so unfortunately we haven't been able to go down there for our usual two week trek. And that's a, an opportunity for me to think about life and get away, but it's an island that I would recommend everyone go to. Um, for me, uh, peripheral nerve surgery is, is my protected island and I want to advance it and I want to uh, foster it. I think the fellowship search is uh, a time of importance because I think when you're having the opportunity to to see a mentor, uh, it's really a a time, it's a fellowship for life. And I tell people when they're my fellows, um, it's not just the learning about peripheral nerve, it's thinking about how I think about problems. 
in medicine or my own life. I think it's time to plan your life and work-life balance. So getting back to my search, I always wanted to be at the Mayo Clinic. I had gone to medical school here. I did my first training elsewhere, but I missed Mayo. And then I was fortunate enough to come back and do my second residency here. When I was a resident here in neurosurgery, I always dreamt about uh, being on staff here, as I had when I was a medical student. I, I looked at a few other jobs, but it was comparing them to the Mayo Clinic. So for me, there really wasn't a comparison. Uh, some other job offers were better than the ones I had here. So I'll tell you a true story. I had met my wife. Uh, she brought her mother to neurosurgery uh, years ago, so 20 happy years ago. And we met and I fell in love at first sight. But the point was is um, we were trying to f plan our future. I was finishing my residency in neurosurgery at Mayo and I had a few job offers, one of which was here. And uh, we were going on our honeymoon in Tahiti and I was really torn between here and one other very good physician, one of our competitors. And I was looking at the beach in Tahiti and I looked at it and I said, you know, here are the advantages for this job, here are the advantages for the other one and almost like an Excel spreadsheet. My wife and I, we barely knew each other. It was a whirlwind romance and um, one of the most touching things is we're looking at the beach beautiful sandy beach in Tahiti. And she looked at me and she said, I don't understand why you're struggling with this. You're up at night, you're tossing and turning. She said, that other job isn't Mayo. She said, so why is it, what do you care about whether they give you research protected time or this or that? You're always gonna be wondering what things would have been for you had you stayed at Mayo. Case closed, move on. A life is short. And I couldn't believe that she had that 30,000 foot vantage point because we barely knew each other. But she knew the essence of what I was looking for, which is the needs of the patient come first, the ideals of the Mayo Clinic, the things that have kept me here over the years. But she was able to see it so quickly, yet I struggled, really struggled, because I think like you, when you have opportunities and you have other offers, you're always comparing apples and oranges. And what I'm very grateful to this day is, is she cut away the other stuff, the extraneous stuff, and got to the meat of the matter, which was, you know, I needed to be here for my own personal growth. And she was right, and I'm very thankful. Uh, during my first or second years, I, I personally quietly wondered if things would have been better at the other job or two because while my clinical practice was blossoming here, some other things may have been better off elsewhere. And then all of a sudden, some things changed at the other places. And my wife continuously reminds me of that. So there's no question in my mind, I made the right decision with my career staying here and with marrying my wife if she's watching. So throughout your career, did you ever consider going private practice or have you been academic focused all the way? Well, you know, it's interesting. My dad was a hand surgeon, and um, he was what we would now call a private academic person. Uh, in fact, I typed his manuscripts. So I learned to type a dollar a page at the age of seven or eight. Um, and I tell my children that, that, you know, hard work comes early. And I've learned to be a good typist. So I have a second skill, a second career, if I ever want one. But the point was is um, his partners in his private practice didn't want to pay for his academic stuff. Through him, I got to meet uh, some famous people in orthopedists who actually did a lot of their work in their garage. And it always impressed me about the greatness that is pandemic in someone's brain rather than in an academic center. So academics can be done in different settings. I applaud people who are able to do that in non-typical institutional focused programs. 
Uh, for me, once I got going, I knew I needed to be in an academic center. To be honest, I didn't know how it all happened. You know, I, I saw my dad's model doing his, uh, his work through his own brain and in a, his office at our house. And then he would do things in the basement and in the garage. And I knew his friends, some of whom were ac true academic people who did it the standard way. But it impressed me that it's not the institution, it's the person. So for me, I think it's easier to do it in an academic place, in a tertiary care facility. But I think on the other hand, you are who you are. And if you ask good questions, you can raise to the top and answer the questions in any model you want. You just have to have a passion for what you're wanting to do. What would you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career as you climbed to the top of your industry? Well, I, I think is having a mentor. I think uh, it's all about relationships. I think the mentor shows you your strengths and weaknesses. I think it helps you realize that uh, your dreams can come true. And again, as I said earlier, I think the biggest thing is, is having a mentor that's with you for more than your residency, your rotation. It's a lifelong uh, problem and a lifelong opportunity, et cetera. So even this, to this day, when I'm shaving in the morning, I'll think about how my mentor would approach a case. And it's just this quiet thought in my mind. Now, I know I could have called him the night before if I really needed him, and sometimes I do. But on the other hand, sometimes it's just that quiet, introspective moment, shaving in the shower, before my case, what would he do that I need to do uh, to, to bring that level of sophistication to my case today? I think the second thing is his passion. I think you have to have the interest in taking things to a next level. And I think then it's sort of that unrelenting desire to achieve, which borders on what's the difference between a dream and an aspiration. And I think it's a fine line. I think we're all faced with challenges. I think you have to be dogged in your pursuit of your dream to make it happen. What advice do you have for the graduating residents and fellows as they enter the professional job market for the first time? Well, I think that's a good question. I think uh, you need to convey your persistence in pursuing excellence. Whatever it is, if you're a Boy Scout, you want to be an Eagle Scout. I think if uh, you're a neurosurgeon, you want to be Spetzler. Um, and I think it's having that in your brain that you don't accept being average. I think the other thing is, is finding a niche where there's a subspecialty or a research area that you own. So I've told students this, I tell my wife this, there's nothing better than walking into a patient room and having the patient ask you the usual litany of questions. And you're answering them at the level that no one else can answer. It's the same thing when you go for a job search. You want to have an area of research that you're able to talk about or a passion that you're the expert at. So if anyone in the audience, when you're giving a presentation, asks you a question, you own that area. And if they ask you something that you don't know, you say, that's a great question. Let's look at that together because that's our next paper. But I think a passion and a, a niche would be the things that I would be looking for because if you're passionate about it, then it's not work. It becomes fun. And then I think if you're innovative, you're able to then create your opportunities, which a good candidate will be successful at. With the world being virtual now and a lot of these conferences being online, what advice do you have for the graduating class as they continue their outreach when really they used to be able to meet folks like yourself at conferences and they do not have the opportunity to do it this year? Well, I think it's even easier. I think we've all been... Um, through this pandemic, 
I think honestly, we've all become a little bit more technologically savvy. Um, I didn't do Zoom calls with patients. There were all these regulations. Uh, then licenses and states relaxed a bit. And then all of a sudden you're here and we're doing this. To me, I think you have a captive audience. I think you schedule something through a secretary. You're on my calendar for 30 minutes. You can't go anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I think it's actually an easier opportunity because I'm in a room with you and vice versa on a Saturday. Isn't that great? At meetings, there are so many things going on. It's a little bit of a three ring circus. I'm enjoying not going to the meetings, to be honest. So I'm very thankful. Uh, my family is thankful. I think the pandemic has allowed me to learn about work-life balance in a different way. So I would tell the candidate to spin it in their favor. So I would say now, get up with this, the administrative assistant of the person you're interviewing, block off that 30 minutes, and then you're it. There's nothing else going on. Pagers are off. Um, other things, you know, you're out of the OR. I have a 30 minute block, whether it's a Saturday or an evening, whatever. You know, technology is at home now. My wife does all of these things on her phone. I'm not that good yet. I still do it at, at work and I'm at my office now, but I love it. And I think it's actually, uh, the market is now in the hands of the candidate to sell themselves. So I would take that mentality and flip the classroom to their benefit. Well, Matthew, I've really enjoyed uh, talking with you today. I think this is a tremendous endeavor. I will say, and I mentioned this to a candidate I was interviewing earlier this morning who's looking for a residency position. And he asked me a question about sort of Mayo and the culture here and what we do better than other places or differently uh, about preparing people for their practice. And I would say, I think this Surgeon Agent podcast series is of tremendous value. And I would say that uh, before this pandemic, none of this was available. So I really commend you for what you're doing. And I think just the brief list of uh, people that you've interviewed have been some personal heroes of mine. So I, I saw some of the people, but I was struck by uh, Joe Zuckerman, just because my dad was at NYU and actually was a trainee. He helped train Dr. Zuckerman years ago. Dr. Zuckerman has risen to uh, great fame in orthopedics, has been president of the AOS and many extreme accomplishments, including running the world of shoulder surgery for many. And I say that very respectfully. Uh, I had the opportunity to train his son, Scott, who's gonna be on your program 20 years from now. And I would be disappointed if it took him 20 years uh, because he has that trajectory. But I would say for people, residents, uh, trainees, this is an, a void that needs to be filled. Uh, you never have the opportunity to ask people how they got to where they are and what are the keys for success. Um, for our residency, and I told our interviewee this morning, uh, we need to do better at preparing people for the real life situations. We do lots to teach them how to clip aneurysms or do things at a different level. But a lot of the things that we've been talking about, the basic how-to, we need to do better. And I think it's opportunities like this to have them available uh, will help the next generation. So thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.